I'm Yolande Poirier from Oracle Technology Network, and I'm here today at DevOps talking to Michael Colling. Michael, hi. Hi, thank you for having me. So uh, you are working on Greenfoot. So tell us, uh, what is Greenfoot? Greenfoot is a programming environment, but it's a programming environment for a very specific target group. It's an educational environment that is specifically designed to learn and teach object-oriented programming for beginners, and especially actually for fairly young beginners. So we're starting at about 14 years age group upwards, and then it scales up fairly well. So it's an introductory environment for learning programming through Java. So uh, how was it developed? I mean, uh, well, we are, I work at a university, at the University of Kent, and we have a research group there that works on computing education, and we develop the environment there. We do research both on tools and on educational theories, um, and we talk a lot to teachers, and we have a small group, and um, we develop it there in our um, computing education research group, and the development is guided um, a lot by interaction with teachers where we um, see what they want, what they need, and where uh, the needs are. And the development is supported by Oracle, who actually supports us very um, consistently over a long time already to um, uh, support the developers who are working on it. So are you also using it um, in any way, I mean, at, uh, at Kent University? Or? Uh, we're using it, yeah, for part of our um, introductory programming course for just specific assignments. We are using it for part of um, the course and we are using it very um, extensively for an outreach program. So we, we have an outreach program where we either get school classes to come in or we go into schools or we get teachers coming in doing teacher training and that is all Greenfoot. So the, the whole schools market is Greenfoot and then it flows into sort of um, university education in, in various bits. And because it is Java, it's not you know, a simple educational language, but it is, um, it's, a, it's a simplified environment, but the language is, a, is full Java, standard JVM and, and compiler. It actually scales up very well, and you can do fairly advanced projects as well. And we actually know of other universities where they use it also for final year AI courses, for example, because um, getting the graphics done is very easy in Greenfoot and they are not interested in programming the graphics. But the examples you build with it, even though they can be fairly simple, they can also be very sophisticated if you want to. Can you give us like some example of what, uh, what kind of game or uh, you can create yeah, with it? Yeah, so the Gre Greenfoot is very um, much specialized for a certain kind of program. So what we are doing uh, mostly is games or simulations or other two-dimensional graphic programs. So the main output of a Greenfoot project always is two-dimensional graphics, often animated. So games is the obvious one. Um, and often with kids, we build simple computer games. So any kind of the um, sort of simple flash-based games you see on websites that, that people tell you can quite easily build in Greenfoot. So you get a very similar effect but during the development process, you get exposed in a very organized way to object-oriented concepts. And simulations is the other thing. So we have some biological simulations, for example, simulations of behavior of ants and anthills, or um, a simulation showing natural selection, or, or some physics-based simulations. Or you can do, um, you know, queuing, like, you know, restaurant or, or thing. Uh, those kinds of simulations are actually quite easily and nicely done in Greenfoot. So many of our teaching examples are those kinds of programs. So uh, can you do uh, multiplayer games, for example? Um, yes, the multiplayer games, um, well, the first step, the, the trivial one that we usually do is just to have two kids sitting at the same keyboard, of course, and that's easy. Uh, so, I mean, it's essentially just still a single machine game. Um, we have some limited support for um, multiplayer games, not real-time games. We have some support for sort of turn-based multiplayer games because it goes, um, the, the Greenfoot programs can be exported and run in a web browser as an applet. And then of course all communication needs to go back through our server because of, of applet restrictions. Um, and so we don't support real time, but we support um, sort of uh, turn-based multiplayer games. So what are the resources that are available for uh, teachers or even like uh, developers? Yeah, we, ha we have in fact resources for both groups, so the, the users, which is the, the learners, the beginners, often kids, 
their tutorials and we have resources for teachers. Um, you can find all of them on the Greenford website, which is greenford.org. And if you start searching there, um, there what you will find uh, in a documentation section is a variety of tutorials. There are written tutorials and there are some video tutorials. Um, that are very popular, but there's also a discussion group where you can actually just ask questions and get answers back from the community. And there are a lot of example programs because, as I said, you can share the program and just upload to a site. So the Greenfoot site acts as a kind of showcase site where a lot of people upload this, their programs. And of course, that gives you a very large body of sample code, you know, where you can just look at how other people have done things. So that's, there's a, a lot of material there for the learners. There's also a textbook. Um, all of that you can find through the Greenfoot website. And then the second half of it is a, another website called the Green Room, which contains material for teachers. So there are worksheets and exams and, and projects and ideas. So that includes both material for formal teaching, like in, in schools and classrooms, or for more casual teaching, if you just want to teach your own kid or if you just want to run a computer club or something like that. That is all in a place called the Green Room. So if you're interested in the teaching material, just Google Greenfoot and Green Room, and you'll find that one as well. Would the Green uh, Room be also open to uh, to developers who want to uh, run a workshop? Yes. So the the Green Room is not entirely public, um, mm -hmm. but that is essentially just because we want to keep the school pupils out. Because, well, for one, there are um, exams with solutions in there, but it's also for you know the the conversation between the teachers is easier if the pupils aren't listening in. Because a lot of teachers say, you know, I'm. I'm teaching next week and I have no clue what I'm doing. You know, I need help. And if they if they know that their pupils are listening in, they can't say that, so it changes. But we are, even though it's officially, I think it says for educators, sort of this vague term, anyone who is interested in teaching anyone about coding, and that includes any developer, any other adult, is very welcome to join the green room and, and come in. It's really just the school pupils we, we are trying to keep out. So do you have uh, anybody in the community that actually uh, are doing like computer clubs or...? Um oh yeah, there are, there are many of those. So the community is already fairly substantial. So we have something around 300,000 active users at, at any one time. Um, and we know of, through the green room, of course, that's not a complete picture, but there's about two and a half thousand people signed up who are all instructors of some kind. Many of them are teachers in schools. So with that number of people, there is a bit of everything. You know, there are some university lecturers in there. There are a lot of school teachers in there. And there are a lot of individuals who just run computer clubs or want to teach their own kid or um, you know, run some more informal programming groups. Um, so you pretty much find examples of every kind in there. And you can get a, a, uh, advice about interactions of any kind. And where are they geographically? I mean, are they like dispersed around the world, or how is yeah, the, the adoption? There, they are. So we, we we created a map once where we can see where they are when they when they sign up, and <laughs> it is not evenly distributed, but it's pretty much around the world with a very, very heavy use in the U.S. and in in Western Europe, um, but uh, very sparse, uh, almost nothing in Africa. Um, a lot sparse, more, more sparsely populated in, in Asia. Um, a reasonably good amount in South Africa and Australia, but really the, the, the two hotbeds really is, is Central Europe and, and Northern America. But I guess that's just distribution of the technology crowd. Right. So you've been here at DevOx and you had a session. Can you talk a little bit about uh, about? Yeah, that was a warm. session yesterday <laughs> about Greenfoot where um, we did just the overview of a what Greenfoot is and what it can do. And essentially it contained two elements. Uh, I showed what Greenfoot is, the tool itself, and gave a demo. And, and then I spent a bit of time talking about how to teach with it, giving some teaching tips. Um, because uh, Greenfoot as a tool in itself is an enabler. By itself it doesn't achieve anything. So just giving someone the software, it's necessary to do something, but it's not sufficient. You know, you, you need you need something more. Just having the software doesn't actually. So, at the end, what actually matters, what what makes success, is what you do with it. Mm. And so, in addition to the software, you need to know now. You know, what do I do with it? So I was talking about that as well. So the community is looking at uh, doing like DevOps for kids. Uh, do you think you're going to be involved with? Oh yes. Although I, when I saw that. Um, announced the DevOps for Kids, I got really excited. I think it's a fantastic idea. It's a, it's a great initiative. Um, and it fits right in with our goals, of course. And we're doing very similar things. So I started 
talking to the organizers and I, I um, would very much like to get involved for the next year when that runs again. Um, it is, it's a fantastic initiative and it aligns perfectly with what we're doing. Right, and you would have actually uh, the community also who yeah. are um, yeah, engineers think. actually uh, teaching the classes. So yes, yeah. and in some sense for this crowd here, because they are Java people, Greenfoot might actually be easier than the other tools because they, are, they, they use things like Scratch. I think, okay, they're fairly easy to pick up. I mean, they're not, not hard to teach for programmers, but they are something that is unfamiliar to many of the developers here. And because mm -hmm. Greenfoot, the language used is standard Java, this crowd here is actually the perfect audience to take it and put it out there in the community because people will know how to use it very, very quickly. It's their lang language in it. So uh, what are the advantages of teaching kids um, programming? I mean, I think there are two very distinct goals here. There's a sort of more specific and a general one. The specific one is really um, that it is necessary to keep the pipeline of Java developers filled. You know, the, the industry, um, a lot of the companies who sponsor this conference here and others depend on Java developers and we have to make sure that a consistent number of people learn the language and you know keep the ecosystem alive and that there is you know development and and in in the java ecosystem but there is also a more general general issue and that is i think every kid in school should get some exposure to computer science uh, and programming is one good way because it can be creative as a foot into computer science of course not every kid needs to become a computer scientist but computer science is so badly represented in schools nowadays that a lot of people never find out what it is and what it can be. And I think every kid should be able to make an informed choice whether computer science is something for them. So I think there should be a compulsory short generalist introduction to computer science and programming for everyone and then an option for kids in school in the later school years to actually take computing in school. It is an important discipline for our society, for our economy um, and the schools are really not handling it well. And so I think we need to attack that on all fronts. We need better computer science in schools and we need initiatives out of schools and we need uh, to enable kids to code on their own in their bedroom if they want to do so. And so we are trying to do all of this. It is really, I think, for um, you know, general modern citizenship, you know, for some uh, an informed, educated citizen to function in modern society, you need to have some understanding of digital technologies and some computing. So do you see any changes like um, maybe in uh, the education? I mean, do you see, do you see actually the um, people really being receptive to, to those ideas? I yes. mean, being in uh, the situation obviously is different in different countries, but right now is actually a real um, sense of, of sort of movement where suddenly things are starting to happen. I live and work in the UK, for example, and there the situation in schools has been dismal for years. And just f since about a year now, a year ago, um, there is now a very strong movement to bring computer science back into schools, which is now not only supported by you know, universities and, and industry who have been pushing for a while, but now government actually has, to, has come on board as well. And there is a real renewal of computing in schools in the UK. A similar thing is going on in the US where um, some organizations are trying to improve it. There's a new AP computing course um, being developed in, in the US um, and several other European countries that I've been in contact with. There's also there are things happening. At the moment it seems really, the tide seems to be turning again where computing, computing was on, on a sort of downhill slope for the last maybe 10 years. It is now really picking up again so it's a, quite an exciting time right now. There is also uh, the comment that uh, we should teach maybe math before we teach uh, programming. What is your take on it? I don't think that's necessary. Um, not all of computing requires really a lot of maths. Um, in fact, you can do quite a bit of programming or digital literacy or understanding of computing concepts without doing maths. And of course, if you want to become a full computer scientist, then you need some maths. There's no doubt about it. But I think requiring or expecting every kid to understand a certain amount of math before show, showing them computing would just turn a lot of them off without good reason at all. Um, I think you can actually do it in parallel. You don't require the math up front. And with Greenfoot, can you teach math? Yes, you can. I, um, 
I mean, we're doing a lot of sort of two-dimensional simple computer games. And of course, they live in a grid-based world, so we have a grid-based coordinate system that where the, the actors are located. And then you get very naturally into simple mathematics. So for example, um, if you have you know, two actors on the screen and you want to know the distance, which is actually in games happens quite often. You want to know, you know, am I close enough to this to, to, for something to happen? And you have Pythagoras automatically. You know, you know the x and y offset and the distance. There is your first simple mathematical formula. And suddenly kids think, you know, they usually have learned Pythagoras in maths a couple of years before and never saw any point of it. You know, they, they, it was never useful for anything. And suddenly in these games it becomes useful. Or if you want to orient yourself, um, you know, if you have an actor and you rotate and want to orient yourself towards something, you've got trigonometry. You know, instantly you know have to if you then want to move a certain distance in that direction you know you're dealing with sine and cosine and suddenly these mathematical concepts become meaningful you know you don't have to use them you could encapsulate them and give kids a method that just does it for them but if you want to teach maths it's an ideal vehicle to bring some mathematics into into practice you know where they don't just memorize the formula right. but they actually have a reason to use it Right, and for anybody who is uh, who has trouble with just abstraction of math, then that yeah, it's a, it's a, a concrete, it's a concrete uh, example illustration mm -hmm. exactly um, of of some mathematical concepts, and of course, you know, statistics because you often want randomness in games. You know, you can do um, through that you can do probabilities and and all this kind of area very very easily as well. It has a very immediate obvious role in these simple computer games. Thank you so much, Michael. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for joining us.